Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is John Frank. I'm the Vice President for EU Government Affairs at Microsoft, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Microsoft Center. Uh, we've had a series of book talks, uh, but this is the first book by Microsoft. <laughs> and so we're going to have Brad Smith, President of Microsoft, who wrote this book, Tools and Weapons, with his co-author, Carol Ann Brown, who's also here. Uh, and um, we'll have that discussion and dialogue with the audience, and then uh, it'll be moderated by Azim Azair, who's um, an distinguished journalist, entrepreneur, uh, and thought leader. And so without further ado, let me bring you guys up and take it away. All right. Thanks, John. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. Nice to see you again. Well, thank you, and yeah. thank you all for coming. I know. It's quite a crowd you've drawn today, uh, which says something about the topic and the, what the, co the author and your, your co-author, uh, Carol Ann. Uh, I really enjoyed the book. Uh, it is a book about uh, technology and regulation and the role uh, of government and that interface you cover an awful lot of material. You talk about cybersecurity, you talk about China, democracy, moderating online content, uh, and a whole host of other subjects. Uh, but why is the book so relevant now? What was the trigger that catalyzed you to sit down and write it? Well, I think we s decided to write the book because we just see these technology issues not just reshaping the, the, the world around us, um, but you know, we felt that they would benefit from being made more accessible to people. Um, you know, when you think about it, um, you know, most people are not deep into technology, um, or if they are, they may not be deep into public policy. Uh, but the truth is this intersection between technology and, and, and policy is impacting everybody. Uh, and you know, to a real degree, we tried to write the book um, you know, for people who were not necessarily the world's greatest experts in everything, but people who were it being impacted and were curious uh, about it. Uh, and so we used this approach of storytelling, both from the present, but also from history, uh, to try to bring the issues to life. Um, one of the sayings that we uh, happen to really like is, a saying that says, uh, history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, uh, but it often rhymes. Uh, and we see in the issues of today, you know, parallels uh, over the last couple of centuries as technology has constantly been changing. And we think there's a lot that at least can you know, help us think about the issues that are important today. Well, one of the strengths of the book, as you say, is the, is the use of, of personal anecdote and story and also history. Let's talk about the personal anecdote. There are a couple of moments which were, I think, aha moments for you where you thought, well, the environment is changing, right? There is an inflection point. Could you share those with us? Well, when we look at the 2010s and we think about something like the regulation of technology or something like the protection of privacy, um, you know, we sort of point to two inflection points. Uh, the, the first was in the United States. It was in 2013, and it was the Snowden disclosures. Uh, and, of course, that's an issue that started in the United States, but you might say it, it actually spread to Europe uh, and impacted views in Europe more than any other part of the world. Um, but you know, what it did is it led, among other things, to you know, the, the tech sector and the U.S. government looking at each other in different ways. Uh, and the tech sector responded in the United States by basically starting to, to lobby uh, the White House, the Obama administration, uh, to embark on surveillance reform. Uh, and you know, John Frake was sort of at the front line of that. Uh, you see you know, he, him mentioned in the, in the first chapter. Uh, but there came a moment, and we share the story, of December of 2013, when there was a meeting at the White House in the Roosevelt Room. There were about 15 tech leaders. I was present. And everybody's going around this long table pressing President Obama and Vice President uh, Biden and all the senior White House staff to change, you know, to reform the National Security Agency, or NSA. And you know, the story we, we share that I thought was very interesting at the time was there was this moment in the meeting when President Obama was listening. He was sympathetic to many of the points that were being expressed. And he said, but he said, I have a suspicion that the guns will turn. You all around this table, you have more data than the government does. 
And there will come a point when the demands that are meet, being made by you of the government will be made on you instead. I made a note of that because I thought he was right. Um, and to me, it, what is surprising is it took five years for the guns to turn. Um, but I think it, it really turned at a very precise moment in time. It was in 2018. It was the Cambridge Analytica disclosures. Um, and then suddenly, you know, boom, you know, not just in, in, in Europe and across Europe, but in Washington, D.C., uh, you know, the pressure uh, grew and the scrutiny increased on the tech sector. Uh, and, you know, if you just take those two moments in time, you know, they were sort of watershed moments and other things have followed from them. Right. There were watershed moments, but you also talked about the importance of history in all of these. So what is it about today that is so specific and different that has you writing a book about the importance of government interfering in the business of, of technology companies, your own career history tells a different story of, of engagement with the government back in the, in the 90s and through, through the, the, the noughties. So how would you characterize what's different about today's environment that means we need to stand up and say, governments, you need to do more and we need to help you do more? Well, and that is the basic thesis of the book, that you know, tech companies need to step up and do more, governments need to do, move faster and do more, and we need to find new ways to do this together. Um, you know, I actually think that when you think about digital technology, what is surprising is not that there are more calls for government to address it today, but rather that it has taken this long for this call to spread around the world. Uh, and of course, you know, on the Brussels agenda, it's it's been a very prominent part of, say, you know, the last European Commission, and certainly this new European Commission. Um, you know, as we've traveled the world, you, you know, any believe me, any time you come to Brussels, you get a longer briefing memo than anywhere else, <laughs> because there's so so many more issues that people are really trying to grapple with, uh, and 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 so the real question might be, why did it take? so long. Um, and you know, it's always very interesting. We have these conversations, and when we go to Silicon Valley or other places, uh, and you know, we say, gee, we think that the industry would be better off if there were you know, some healthy regulation in place. You know, we're sometimes greeted by people who say, like, have you lost your minds? Um, and the point we make is, you know, just think about the world in which we live. I, you know, it's obviously familiar to all of you. But you know, we go to the grocery store and you know, we look at the nutrition label and it's standardized, it's regulated. We have confidence that the food we buy will be safe. We have confidence that at the pharmacy, the products we buy will be safe. We have confidence in the airbags or, or seat belts or you know, you know, aircraft. You know, all around us, there are certain government standards uh, that do promote and go far towards ensuring a, a healthy market. And you might say digital technology, I believe it's fair to say, has gone more decades largely being unregulated uh, than any technology that has reshaped society as, as much as it has. And I think, um, you know, to some degree, this is a little bit of a product uh, of, uh, in some cases, the, the times in which we've lived. Mm -hmm. um, especially in the United States, where it's just been you know, it, very, very difficult, if not impossible, to get a political consensus to you know, create a new government agency or reorganize a current government agency. Um, and it helps explain why you know, a high percentage of the new rules and regulations have come from Europe uh, more than mm -hmm. any other place. But I think we've finally reached a point in time where people recognize that um, you know, this technology is not only ubiquitous, it's just literally impacting everything we do. You know, whether our kids will have jobs, what kinds of jobs uh, they'll have, what kinds of jobs we'll have, what kinds of skills we'll need them, whether we're going to have any real privacy protection, um, whether the security of our information or our governments or our democracies will be protected. Um, you know, all of these are being shaped by technology. And then you look at AI. Um, and, you know, the, the, one of the fundamental conclusions we came to that, that, that led us to, to write the book is that in every era 
uh, of major change, there's sort of one invention that is the foundation for many others. Um, the first one was really the steam engine. Uh, the second was really electricity. The third one was the combustion engine. And if you look at the economy of Europe or the world a century ago, it was really an economy that was just reshaped everywhere by the transition from the horse to the combustion engine. You know, that's what made it possible to have cars and trucks, but also tractors and tanks and airplanes. And if you look at where we are today, and you just think about the next 30 years, we, you know, we feel that we've entered a real AI era where artificial intelligence is going to be the foundational invention that then transforms everything else. And you know, we're not obviously unique in concluding that, um, but it does make, I think, all of this more important, and it makes it a, a time when we need to broaden the public discussion. I, I'm curious about whether, given the concentration of power, the five big US tech firms, a couple of big Chinese ones, whether this is a discussion just about regulating the technologies, or is it also about regulating these large legal personalities, the corporations themselves? Well, to some degree, it's probably both. Um, you know, I don't think you can avoid the fact that there are a relatively small number of companies that have an outsized impact. Um, so by definition, you know, we're talking about what these rules or, or just responsibilities mean you know, for, for companies uh, that are having this impact. Um, you know, for a technology that is so uh, quintessentially global in character. But at the end of the day, I think it's also important to think about the fact that you know, it's not, we're not in a world where technology is only used or created by five companies or eight companies or even just tech companies. You know, what's interesting is in the United States now, 60% of all tech jobs, meaning for computer science or data science uh, majors, are outside the tech sector. Um, and that's quickly spreading around the world. And just as you know, every large organization, maybe it was a company, maybe it was a government, you might have people that were you know, dedicated to creating customized software for the institution, you know, that's quickly spreading to AI. Um, so the notion that the only people in the technology business are tech companies um, you know, I, is a misnomer. And so when we're talking about creating rules for technology, the truth is we're sort of creating rules for everybody. And I, I think that's a good thing for us to, to think about as we move forward. So let's get a little bit granular then. What would that regulation look like for, for AI? I mean, for if an AI algorithm is dealing with human inference, so it's, it's inferring behaviors about a person and then we're going to make a decision about that, it, should that go through some kind of broad-based population testing, the way we might test a pharmaceutical drug? What, what, what should the actual me mechanic for this regulation be? Well, I, the first thing I would say is we're at an early stage, and you know, we did not write this book because we had an answer to every question under the sun. You know, we wrote the book in, in many ways to identify the technology, how it's being created, how it's being used, and the kinds of issues we're all going to need to reason through together. Um, now, then to answer your question, I would say two things. One is, you, know, you can think about something like this horizontally. Um, you know, what are the issues that apply to all aspects of artificial intelligence? And you know, there are, are certain principles that you know, we've worked at Microsoft, others here, including in Brussels, have worked to develop. Um, I think a very good one is this, this sense of accountability. You know, I think we should all want to live in a world where machines are accountable to people. Uh, and then the people who create the machines are accountable to the public at large. And you know, that's something that you could say, you know, that, that applies for all forms of AI. It'll impact, say, product liability rules and the like. But there's another aspect of this. One of the interesting attributes of artificial intelligence is it's almost something that works you know, in particular what technologists like to call scenarios. You, know, you create it to be used in a particular scenario, and then it is used in particular ways. So a good example is facial recognition. Um, you know, so then you start to now get into a very you know, discrete area of artificial intelligence. You know, it's obviously the ability of an 
AI system to recognize people's faces, maybe in real time. Um, and now you start to have a very concrete set of issues. And once you get to questions that are that concrete, it's much easier to say, well, gee, let's now define the problems we want to solve. Well, one of the problems is that facial recognition today is more accurate for a white man than it is for a woman or for anyone of color. And hence, it's going to lead to bias and incorrect results. Um, you know, what kind of regulation will help protect people from being discriminated against? Um, or in another area, one of the issues that you know, we just tend to think is of fundamental importance, what does it mean for the future of democracy if a government can instantly recognize everyone who has gone to the city square, who is standing up peacefully to protest? Um, how do we feel about people who, as people who live in a democracy? Um, do we want our government to do that or not? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, our, one of our points is, gee, the time to decide is now. Um, because you know, this is already at the cusp of reality. And in a, a short number of years, um, any government anywhere in the world will be able to deploy technology in that way. And if uh, the world's democracies, if the European Union doesn't define an answer to that question, then who will? Mm. Who will set the example for the protection of you know, rights that, I will argue, at the end of the day, are far more important than any particular feature in a technology product that genuinely you know, we should call timeless and therefore we should want to uphold? What would you say to the rights organizations and the AI researchers like AI Now or the Ada Lovelace Institute who say, in the case of facial recognition, it's too risky, their benefits aren't strong enough, it's not material to you financially until we figured out what those rights are, until we figured out ways of introducing a, just, a due process and, and the correct protections, you shouldn't sell them and you shouldn't overly develop those technologies. Well, I think it's an interesting argument, and you know, it's it's well worth engaging in real discussion about it. Um, I, myself, and we in the book, uh, you know, don't take that as our, our point of view. You know, for a couple of reasons. One is we believe that facial recognition can do a lot of good for the world. Um, you know, it can enhance consumer convenience. Um, it can help solve real world problems. One of the scenarios, again, thinking of scenarios that I'm really enthusiastic about, is where some NGOs are using it to identify missing children mm -hmm. or missing adults who are family members that may be suffering, say, from mental illness. Um, and you know, it's reuniting families. Um, so I'm really reluctant to say, let's stop people from using technology in a way that will reunite families when it can help them do that. Uh, the second thing I would say is, you know, don't ban it if you actually believe there is a reasonable alternative that will enable us to, I'll say, address this problem with a scalpel instead of a meat cleaver. In other words, let's identify the problems if we can and believe we can and address rules that will ensure that, for example, it's not used for mass surveillance or certainly any kind of surveillance that conflicts with you know, the fundamental protection in the law that human rights would say uh, people should have. The last thing I would say is there's only one way at the end of the day to make technology better, and that's to use it. You know, that's how people get real world feedback. That's how you constantly improve it. Um, so you know, I, I think that there's a lot of merit to having a broad discussion, but at the end of the day, we would be advocates for a path that enables the technology to be used in, in scenarios that are socially beneficial. And there are already ways to craft rules that will prevent some of the abuses we should all be concerned about. Thank you. Let's turn to a, another dimension in the book, uh, which is the international geopolitical uh, dimension. It's mostly framed, a lot of your examples are European examples, but it's mostly framed around, around China. So I'm curious about how uh, a company like Microsoft thinks through the global governance of technologies in a point where there are sometimes fundamental, and you, you go into this in your chapter on China, fundamental differences in the values and the historical um, antecedents of those values 
uh, the Chinese Confucian way of thinking and the Western rights-based, agency-based uh, way that comes out of Aristotelian uh, ideas. Is a, you know, we have this chapter on China, which, believe me, was far and away the hardest chapter to write. Um, and it's fascinating to think about it in the context of what's happening in the world. Um, you know, I had a conversation just a couple of weeks ago with somebody who had you know, been in one of the most senior uh, positions in the U.S. intelligence community. And I put the, to this person the question, um, do you think we're headed towards a technology cold war between the United States and China? And the person's response was, well, I think we're already in one. Um, and you know, I, I think there are really important and broad and deep uh, issues for everyone in the world to think about and, and, uh, and learn more about in terms of where the U.S. and, and China are going in, in their bilateral relationship. Um, but I think here we're in Europe. And so, you know, I, I think uh, the real question is, what does all this mean for Europe? Mm -hmm. uh, what should Europe do? Um, and I, I would advocate for two things. One, Europe needs a path for the future that will serve Europe well. Um, and we should recognize that in an AI era, um, you know, quite possibly uh, the ingredient that will have more economic value than anything else is data. Uh, you know, we point in our book to studies that suggest that by the year 2030, 50% of the economic value of a new automobile will actually consist of you know, computers and data. Uh, and so I think the first question for Europe in every sector of the economy, really, is how to ensure that the economic value in data is something that benefits European companies and European industries. You know, if there's not a clear strategy to do this, I do think you could see a future where the economic value in data you know, sort of migrates to either the west coast of the United States or the east coast of China. Um, so you need a clear strategy to do that. And you know, I think this is obviously under consideration not only here in Brussels, but I think it's a, especially at the forefront of conversation in Berlin. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I think that there are real proposals that you know, actually have some merit to them around open data uh, and you know, ways to uh, ensure that European entities um, get economies of scale, can work with data, retain ownership in it, and ultimately use it to develop better AI and, 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 and create the next generation of the services and products that they create now. But then second, I think that there is an enormously important transatlantic issue here. Because you know, one of the fundamental attributes of artificial intelligence is that it gets better faster based on how much data you have to feed into a machine mm -hmm. learning system. One of the things that is just so interesting in working with data scientists is you never meet a data scientist who says, oh, I, I, I have all the data I need. I don't want any more. <laughs> Everybody always wants more data. So you know, if the United States is competing with China, if Europe is competing with China, the first thing you have to recognize is that maybe for the first time since the Industrial Revolution began in the 1750s, there is another part of the world, namely China, that has an inherent comparative advantage. It's called 1.4 billion people. Now today, it's 1.4 billion people that have a per capita GDP that's roughly a quarter of what exists, say, in the United States or, or most of Western Europe, but that's going to continue to rise. And so what it tells you is that over the course of the next 30 years, China, in all probability, is going to create more data that can feed more AI systems than any country on Earth. That is, I think, just an unavoidable fact. So. What does the world that is based on, I'll say, uh, you know, the Western values born in Europe, created in Greece, do as we think about all of these issues in the future? And I would argue that what we really should be thinking about is a global AI alliance of the world's democracies. 
um, you know, take the European Union with its 512 million people, and you know, some of those will be part of Brexit, but they will share common <laughs> values. Uh, take the 320 million people in the United States. Uh, think about the 32 million people in Canada. Think about South Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. You, know, you can knit together a group of like-minded countries who share long-standing values, who I think can be committed to technology moving forward in a way that honors and respects long-standing human rights that we all share and creates real opportunities for our economies to grow together. But I think it will take something like that. And you know, one of our messages at a time when we appreciate the US government is not exactly at the forefront of multilateralism, <laughs> is that, in fact, the world's democracies need to come together. Uh, and that is the best path for navigating the next 30 years of an AI era in a way that both advances technology and jobs in the economy and respects and protects human rights. I love your emphasis on, uh, on democracies uh, here. Now, we know that there is a new player at the international stage, a new type of player. It's the tech company. You talked about it a little bit in, in the book that alongside the nation states and now these big four or five semi-sovereign uh, 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 tech businesses and, and until uh, a couple of days ago, one sovereign nation state actually had an ambassador to the tech industry until he, he, he went to a tech firm, I think, Casper. Which one was that? <laughs> Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, Microsoft, right, indeed. So now... The, the thing about the, the, the nation state in, in a democratic nation state is that there is a mechanism of accountability for that executive, uh, that, that there's a set of elections that, that roll around. Uh, I don't yet have to call you Mr. President for all the power that Microsoft holds in the world, but what is the mechanism that, that should exist for the democratic accountability and the citizen accountability of technology companies that are powerful as, uh, as yours and, and your four peers? Well, we have no problem as a company signing up for the proposition that companies need to be accountable to governments, not the other way around. And governments hopefully are accountable to the public, at least in a democratic nation. Um, and you know, to the extent that we have companies that are bigger than governments, we would say, well, you know, that's a problem. Um, and that's not the, the kind of problem that any of us should be sanguine uh, about and, you know, and, and, and you know, fail to address. Um, I think that the interesting challenge comes when you have technology that spreads across borders and then arguably becomes more difficult for governments to address. Um, you know, one of the interesting lessons, the historical lesson that we draw upon, is that in the United States, the modern federal government, meaning a government that regulates the economy, was really born in 1886. Why 1886? Because that was the birth of the first regulatory agency in the United States. It was called the Interstate Commerce Commission. The Interstate Commerce Commission was really created to do one thing, regulate railroads. Mm -hmm. Why was it born to, create, to regulate railroads? Because these railroads cross state lines. You know, and you know, initially there was this question, well, who was going to regulate these railroads? Um, and the states started to regulate the railroads, uh, but then the railroads went to the Supreme Court and said, wait a second, you can't do this. You, know, you might think that you're, you're the state of Maryland, uh, but, the, but, but, but what you're doing is impacting you know, commerce in Virginia, and that's beyond your border. And so when the United States Supreme Court said, no, states can't do this, then the US Congress said, well, if it can't happen at the state level, we'll do it at the national level. So the regulation evolved to match the geographic reach mm -hmm. of the technology. So what do we do today? Because we're talking about technology that by definition goes around the world. And we're sending John Frank to the United Nations, but I don't think the United Nations is ready to assume the world role of global regulator, nowhere, nor is any country really yet you know, saying that's something that makes sense. So how do we address these issues? And, and we, we say in the conclusion that that's almost really the fundamental conundrum of our time in some ways. But as soon as you identify that as a question, I think some of the answers start to become obvious. Governments have to work together. 
Now, there's just no way to address these issues unless countries and governments work more closely together. And of course, you know, here we are, we're meeting, sitting in the place that is the world's best example of how governments figured out how to work together without you know, surrendering their national borders after World War II and especially you know, in the 1950s. But the other thing that we would say is these are issues that require oftentimes not only that governments work together, but you know, what we would describe as an, a new era of multi-stakeholder mm -hmm. diplomacy. Uh, you know, if you look at these problems around something like cybersecurity, um, if we want to move fast, we're going to be much more effective if governments, the tech sector, and civil society all take new steps and work together. And you know, that's why we point to examples like the Paris call, which addressed cybersecurity, the Christchurch call last year, which addresses digital safety and the threat of terrorism. You know, these are all the kinds of steps that I think are uh, examples of the kind of innovation in the realm of public policy and diplomacy that we need to think about and, you know, and think hard about how far we want to go, but start to learn from them. Now, we've about 15 minutes left and there are 150 brilliant brains on the other side of the table. I know Microsoft now loves open source, so I'm happy to take <laughs> some uh, questions uh, from uh, the audience out there. I'll probably take them in, in pairs so that we, we get a chance to put them together. So there's a lady over there and then a gentleman there. Lady there with the blonde hair, yes? Yeah. Oh, pink hair, sorry, <laughs> my mistake. Thank you. Hi there, um, it's Jessica Leonard from Visa. Um, thank you so much for the book. As you say, it was extremely accessible and I've, uh, given it to a bunch of family members at Christmas. I don't know if my mom's read it yet, but hopefully. <laughs> um, I was struck by how many times during the book um, you presented anecdotes of how Microsoft was prepared to be an outlier um, on certain issues, um, and times where you felt that actually distinguishing yourself from others within your sector might be a risky thing to do, but you thought that cost-benefit, it made sense. So I don't know if anyone else was following what happened today. The, the CTO of uh, Amazon uh, stood up at an event today and asked Nick Clegg, um, to explain what Facebook was doing on privacy. And I don't obviously work for either of those companies. Um, but do you think it's inevitable that um, this schism between the tech companies is going to widen, given that some of the core business models depend on what you touched on in the book as a kind of surveillance business model versus um, a core business which might be in technology of other kinds? Do you think that there is going to be this kind of war, or do you think it's avoidable? Great. Let's hold that question. We'll take the other second question. We can bundle them together. Sure. Fabian Delcross with uh, the European Commission. Um, reacting on your call for like-minded countries to come together to actually start working on solutions, explore common rules uh, to deal with the Chinese, I would say, data dumping. Um, one year from now, I think it was in Davos, Prime Minister Abe from Japan launched an initiative called Data Free Flow with Trust. Mm -hmm. The G7, the G20, uh, did picked up on this initiative and basically his script was with less passion and probably less communication skills, pretty much the same substance as you just delivered. There is a G7 uh, coming uh, in the US. Uh, are you going to seize this opportunity to progress uh, on this agenda? Good, I'll try to provide brief answers so then we can have more yeah. questions. Um, I do think that there will be more scrutiny of behavioral advertising, um, you know, just because that's the, the area of technology where you know, all of the market incentives sort of push inexorably towards greater monetization of data. Uh, and I think that there will be more of a focus on that because to some degree, uh, greater monetization comes from uh, algorithms that more precisely target specific groups of people. And yeah, I think there's even a risk that we're uh, you know, creating these cyber tribes that are not um, being exposed to the same news of the day. And this is you know, even creating some new challenges for democracy itself. Um, I don't think that necessarily means there'll be a, a, a regulatory battle or war in the tech sector, but I think that's going to be a topic that probably grows in importance uh, over the course of this decade. I think with respect to the G7, I don't know what will happen in this next G7 in the, uh, in, in the United States, but I, I do think that over the course of, let's just say, the next five years, 
um, there's a balance to be struck. Um, yeah, I do think that yeah, there are increasingly people in Europe asking how we ensure that data serves Europe. Um, and yeah, we're, we're seeing a trend that uh, by European governments and countries that say, you know, we'd like more European data to stay in Europe. Uh, we want it to be processed uh, pursuant to European laws and rules and European rights. And you know, there are some in the tech sector who you know, are more likely to stand up and say, you know, this is terrible. We really need to get all data flowing everywhere around the world. And you know, our position as a company, I would say, is um, a little more nuanced than that. I mean, first I would say, look, our, our, we see our role and frankly our business approach as to be the, the, the technology infrastructure that will enable local companies, governments, and countries to get economic value from their data. And if they think the best way to do that is to keep data in Europe, have it processed only pursuant to European rules, and frankly managed in a way that ensures that a growing economic pie has slices for European companies that matter, I think our response is, we want to support that. Now, at the same time, I think there will be days when, you know, and I'll just say an automaker in Germany wants to align with an automaker in the United States or in Japan and you know, find a way to federate or share its data. Um, so if one goes so far as to you know, deny Europeans the opportunity to work across borders, you know, then I think that could actually uh, you know, undermine Europe's own prospects for success. Yeah, but at the end of the day, I mean, the one thing that I do feel is clarifying for us as a company is like we have a very clear mission. You know, it's like we're supposed to create technology that enables other people to be more successful in their lives, you know, and with their organizations. And I don't, and therefore, we, you know, we don't approach this with some ideology on any particular issue that says, oh, data has to move around in an unrestricted way. Um, we do believe, and as I mentioned, this notion of uh, you know, uh, you know, countries working together and promoting a global AI alliance. But there's plenty of room within that framework, you know, for countries to figure out the best way to ensure that this data serves their own economic needs. Thank you. Let's get a couple more questions. We had uh, there's one at the back and one at the front, just to keep you on your toes. If we keep them brief, so Brad has a chance to answer. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Adamson. Hi, Brad. Hi. Um, I don't want to oversimplify a very sophisticated argumentation in your book, but the old narrative, as you know about anybody else in this room, is that uh, there's too much regulation as far as industry is concerned, especially in the tech sector, and it's, it's a bad thing because, A, regulation is always too slow in terms of the speed of technological um, innovation, and secondly, even if it was speedier regulation, it would kind of stifle innovation anyway. So. So when you're, you're in broad terms, when you talk about for the whole tech sector in particular, the, the need, uh, the, the pressing need for more regulation, I presume you're not talking about a return to status quo ante. You're talking about maybe a new kind of, a different way of doing not just regulation, but policy making. Can you give us some ideas about mm -hmm. what, it, what you have in mind in that, where the two sides may be private and public sectors are more collaborative? Is that what you're hinting at? Yep. Okay, we'll take some other questions. Thanks. Um, my name is Timo Costa. I'm not the tech ambassador, but the cyber ambassador for the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. I have not read your book yet because I'm Dutch. I was waiting for a free copy. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, but I'll read it soon. <laughs> um, I wanted to build on a, uh, the point that Azim made about accountability and, and several questions about data. Um, I, I totally take your point that, that governments need to act uh, if they want to be ready to incorporate new technologies and make sure that their, their societies uh, react rightly to it. And, and the tech companies can help them to accelerate those decisions. But my assessment is that the, the trust between governments and the tech uh, community is not yet where it should be. Um, I don't know how you assess this, but um, you haven't talked about trust. Do you feel that there's some work to do? You have only briefly uh, yeah. talked about uh, civil society, um, I think that's an important arena where we have to play as well. You've just <coughs> supported uh, the start of the uh, Cyber Peace Institute. Could you talk a little bit about that and what the role of that could be in this um, um, joint effort? Sure. Let me see if I can bring these two questions together and hit a few points. Um, 
First, I would say, look, by and large, digital technology is mostly unregulated. I mean, we may have privacy rules in a place like Europe, um, but you know, compared to a lot of products on the market, um, I at least would argue that digital technology is much less regulated than most. Now, that doesn't mean that you know, we should go advocate for heavy-handed regulation. And in fact, Paul, I think your question is interesting because we do actually advocate for bringing into the world of regulation a particular approach that is used in the world of technology. And it's called this notion of create a minimum viable product. In mm -hmm. other words, the way technology advances the most quickly is don't necessarily try to create a product with 200 features, create a product with 10. And you get into the market, you get real world feedback, and then you learn, and then you can build on it and make the product better. What is an example for a regulatory counterpart? Well, we would say that when you think about facial recognition technology and this problem of bias, the truth is no one wants to buy a facial recognition service that is biased. But the market cannot really work effectively today in our view because no jurisdiction is, has yet passed a statute that basically would say, if you want to sell facial recognition technology, make sure that your product is available for testing so that academics and consumer groups can go test it and they can do product comparisons. So, you know, I believe me, I've taken this message to like 12 countries now and I've said, well, somebody just, you know, just it, pass a law. It doesn't have to answer every question, just say this. And if the country or even a state in the US has a market that matters, you could probably just pass it in one place and everybody's gonna recognize, oh, to participate in this market, we have to make this available for testing. And then a year or two later, you would know, is the bias problem largely corrected or is more regulation needed? So, you know, I think a world where people can get more comfortable with smaller measures that you can build upon as distinct from big measures that answer every potential question would actually serve technology well. Um, now, I also agree that you know, trust is at one level fundamental to technology use. I mean, one of the reasons that we as a company have long been supportive of stronger privacy regulation than most of the companies in our industry is because we've long felt that people are not going to trust privacy protection just because a bunch of companies tell them they should. You know, why do you trust the, the pharmaceutical products that you buy. It's because you know that it is an overlay of both companies that you hope are doing the right thing and regulators that are insisting that those companies do so even if they're not as well motivated or as well organized as they should be. Uh, and you know, so I would say trust is critical. Trust for consumers will only come when we have the right combination of self-regulation or responsibility and government regulation. And there is not, I think you're, you're right to say, um, you know, as much trust between, um, say, the industry and you know, government as you might hope. Now, on the other hand, I would say uh, that, you know, I just think that there are certain uh, laws of human nature one of the laws of human nature is people who are regulated like to complain about being regulated. Mm -hmm. That's okay. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know how it, it was for you all when you went to a university in Europe. When I went to a university uh, in the United States, part of being a student is you complained about the food every day. <laughs> it didn't even matter whether the food was good or bad. You just complained about it. Um, you know, so, you know, there's always going to be a tension, and it's, it's even a healthy tension. Uh, you know, maybe the only thing worse than regulators and regulated that are complaining about each other is that regulators is regulators and regulated that are so closely bonded together that they're not catching each other's failings. Um, so mostly I would say we should get on with it um, and start to, to pursue some practical progress. That's what we're trying to do with the Cyber Peace Institute. You know, it brings together people from industry, people from academia, people from NGOs, um, to at least do some more work to share information about cybersecurity attacks and cybersecurity best practices. And mostly I'll say the more we can actually do some concrete things, the more we'll have to build on. I think that's the common theme in the, basically the, the two questions that the two of you just posed. 
Thank you, Brad. We have time for one brief question and a brief answer. So there's a gentleman up here at the front, if you could give him the mic. Hi, my name is Bruno Libaber from CER, the Center on Regulation in Europe. One of the features of the digital economy is the is speed of change, speed of change of technology, speed of change of uh, business models. Now, vis-a-vis -vis that, regulators are more and more led to think that they should experiment. They should learn, like all of us do, and, and that leads to the concept of, of sandboxing, sandbox mm -hmm. regulation. Now, this is very nice, and I think it has a lot of appeal to, to a number of people, but when you talk to industry, uh, how do you reconcile, we are being asked, this concept of sandbox regulation with the very classical and logical need for industry to have a stable regulatory environment. What's your answer? Well, I guess I would say two things. I mean, one is more specific, which is, you know, I think the world is too diverse to, to say that everything should be done only one way or the other way. Um, and, you know, I, I do think that, you know, regulatory sandboxes like technology sandboxes can make sense in certain places for certain experiments. and. Um, and we should be open-minded uh, about it, and we'll all learn and we'll refine. And you know, it's probably not something that should spread across the entire technology landscape, but we should try it in a few places. Um, but the second thing I would say is a broader theme. You know, for the the 26 years that I've I've worked at Microsoft, and I look at somebody like Bernard Verne, who was the president of Microsoft Europe when I was in year one at Microsoft, working you know, with him for him in Paris. Every one of those 26 years, I think you could have gone to many places in the world and said, you know what? Things have never been moving faster in the world than they are right now. And everybody would have gone, yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's never been changing as fast as it is right now. And you know, in some ways, it's true. Um, but if you really want to think back to a time when technology was reshaping society faster, perhaps, than at least what in Western Europe and the United States than any other time, the 1870s. That's right. Oh my gosh, there's electricity going to these buildings and we never had electricity before. Oh, and my gosh, there's this thing called the phonogram and we can hear you know, something that was recorded. And oh my gosh, there's a telephone and we can talk to somebody who you know, is down the street or in another city or another country. And I could just go on and on. And I, I just think there are times when we need to remind ourselves that you know, we in some ways are living in a unique time. But in other ways, you know, history really does rhyme. And I think we do ourselves a disservice if we think that everything we're dealing with is so new and so different um, that we're just ill-equipped uh, to experiment or to deal with it in new ways. And you know, I think as much as anything else, that's part of what motivated us to write the book. Um, you know, we, we talk about like the last run of a horse-drawn uh, you know, fire engine in the streets of New York in 1922, and how you know, people felt their culture was changing, their jobs were disappearing. Um, you know, and in the long run, everything sort of works out OK, because everybody adapts. The real question is how you manage the change along the way. And so you know, there's so much to learn from the technology that's new. But what we're fu fundamentally trying to bring to this is what I would call you know, sort of more traditional, timeless values and an appreciation, perhaps a little bit of inspiration, that you know we can do this, because you know as Europe, North America, the world, we've dealt with a lot of very similar challenges before. Brad, we are out of time, but thank you very much for sharing your wisdom, and thank you very much for the book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.